Good evening, everyone. Today's topic is the mitral valve and regurgitation. It's March 17th, St. Patrick's Day, so the talk today will have a celebration of Ireland running through it, my home country. So I hope you enjoy it, and let's proceed. Today we're going to talk about the mitral valve anatomy first. Uh, we're going to discuss the etiology of mitral regurgitation. We're going to assess the mitral valve in 2D and 3D. We're going to talk about grading severity of mitral regurgitation, indications for surgery, and factors that predict failed repairs. Just some disclosures. Neither of these two gentlemen are me. So manage your expectations accordingly. Interesting facts, the name of the mitral valve comes from its shape, which is the, the, the bishop's mitre. Again, uh, an Irish reference. We'll keep going. So we're going to talk about now about mitral valve anatomy. The mitral valve is a Pringle. The valve is saddle shaped like a Pringle. The anterior posterior diameter is the front and back of the saddle, the higher parts of the curve. The lateral and medial aspects are the lower parts of the valve. You can imagine the horn of the saddle at the anterior aspect, and this is where the aortic valve will be found. When you look at the valve from the posterior aspect, the crescenteric coaptation line between the anterior leaflet anteriorly and near the aortic valve and the posterior leaflet make a smiley face. The annular height is from the surface of the valve to the top of the AP diameter. I'll just point out to avoid any potential confusion in your minds about the geometry. It's super helpful to think of this as a saddle, but recognize that the saddle is atypical. If you're sitting in a real saddle, it's longest from front to back and narrow in width, where it's, whereas it's the opposite here. It would be a very difficult saddle to fit on. So question number one, which of the following structures are at risk of injury during routine mitral valve surgery? Is it one RCA, coronary sinus, non-coronary cusp of the aortic valve? Is it the SA node, AV node? left circumflex and the RCA, coronary sinus, left circumflex, non-coronary cusp of the aortic valve, or is it right coronary cusp of the aortic valve, AV node, RCA, and the Vesian vein? Well, to answer this, you really need to know about the mitral valve's relation to other structures. The orientation of the valve and its relation to other structures are important to understand. This will facilitate proper assessment of the valve and recognition of complications post mitral valve surgery. So as you can see from the diagram, the mitral valve is situated posterior and lateral to the aortic valve. Remember, the horn of the saddle near the aortic valve. It's to the left of the tricuspid valve. It's anterior to the coronary sinus. It's posterior to the left circumflex artery. The posterior portion is in close proximity to the bundle of his. And the valve is slightly tilted with the anterior portion superior to the posterior portion. So clinical implications include possible complications to consider post-surgery such as tear of the coronary sinus, aortic valve injury, tricuspid valve problems, conduction system abnormalities, and circumflex artery injury. Lastly, I'll draw attention to the area in the back between the aortic valve and the mitral valve, which is called the intervalvular fibrosa. The intervalvular fibrosa is the common fibrous. So the answer to question one is the coronary sinus, left circumflex, and non-coronary cusp of the aortic valve. This diagram just illustrates the proximity of the left coronary cusps, the aortic valve, and the coronary sinus, especially when they're putting a ring in. Okay. 
moving on to the mitral apparatus. The mitral valve itself is a complex apparatus that requires each individual component to function normally for optimal valvular function. It includes the annulus, the leaflets, the papillary muscles, the chordae, and the left ventricular itself. The annulus is a dynamic fibromuscular ring. It's oval and saddle shaped as we've reviewed, although it flattens in disease with anterior and posterior annular segments. The anterior annulus makes up one third of the annular circumference. It forms part of the cardiac trigone or skeleton and it's relatively immobile and well supported. It's mostly fibrous tissue with muscular portions as it approaches the posterior annulus and it forms part of the LVOT. The posterior annulus makes up the remaining two thirds of annular circumference. It's mostly membranous and muscular and blends into the muscular LA and LV. It's weaker and thinner than the anterior annulus, especially posterior central annulus where it's almost devoid of collagen and mostly loose connective tissue. Thus, this is prone to dilatation. Annular motion during systole when the valve closes consists of translation away from the apex, so up, contraction posteriorly, and then folding in the anteroposterior plane. In the di diagram, this is illustrated by starting with the yellow circle, the valve and diastole, and seeing its position displaced up, posteriorly, and folded to get the red shape in systole, which is the saddle shape. These movements open up the LVOT and optimize flow to assist in coaptation. Annular dilatation is defined by an AP diameter of greater than 35 millimeters. As we already know, the valve is... There are three main ways of naming the parts of the anterior and posterior leaflets. Classically, the nomenclature was based on anatomy. So the posterior leaflet scallops were named anterolateral by the LAA, middle and posterior medial. The most common classification is the Carpentier classification, which divides the leaflets into three segments each. P1 closest to the LAA, i.e. anterolateral, P2, P3 for each posterior scallop, with corresponding A1, A2, A3 on the anterior leaflet. The Duran classification may sometimes be used. In this system, each leaflet has a 1 and 2 area. Posterior leaflet is bigger, so it also has a PM or post-middle designation in the middle. There are two commissural areas, C1 and C2. Everything is named according to their attachment to the papillaries. So everything with a 1, as in C1, P1, A1, attaches to the anterolateral papillary, and everything with a 2, C2, P2, A2, attached to the posterior medial papillary. So question number two. A 65-year-old male suffers an inferior ST elevation MI. Two days later, he has sudden onset of severe dyspnea, is hypotensive, and is rushed to the cath lab. A TEE is performed in the cath lab. What is the most likely cause of his symptoms? 1. Ruptured P2 cordae and severe MR. 2. Anterior lateral papillary muscle rupture and severe MR. 3. Posterior or medial papillary muscle rupture and severe MR. 4. Leaflet tethering and severe functional MR. 5. Annular dilatation and severe functional MR. So let's talk about the subvalvular apparatus. This is comprised of the papillary muscles, of which there are two, and the chordae tendinae, of which there are more than 100. This diagram shows the four main categories of chordae. First order is primary. They attach to the ipsilateral leaflet edge, prevent prolapse of margins, and are responsible for normal coaptation. Second order or secondary attach to the body of the leaflet and relieve excess tension. They're associated with the tethering effect of left ventricular remodeling. And third order or tertiary and struts, they attach to the base of the anterior and posterior leaflet respectively. And this is by the Maslow classification. So the two papillary muscles are named for their location anterior lateral and posterior medial. 
The anterolateral papillary receives a dual blood supply from the LAD and the circumflex, while the posterior medial one receives a single blood supply from the RCA and is more prone to ischemia. Ischemia and papillary rupture can lead to acute severe MR and heart failure. So the answer to question number two is number three posterior medial papillary muscle rupture and severe MR, because this was an inferior MI supplied by the RCA, which is the territory of the posterior medial papillary muscle. Moving on to the left ventricle, the size, shape, and function of the left ventricle determine the systolic coapting force, the position of the papillary muscles and chordae, and their effect on leaflet position and mobility i.e. it influences potentially all the components of the mitral valve. This diagram shows an ischemic ventricle on the right whose remodeling has changed the orientation of the posterior medial papillary causing valvular incompetence. Coaptation is a function of the opposing tethering and closing forces. Tethering pulls the leaflets down while the closing forces push up to help the valve close. Increased tethering forces are due to LV dilatation, spherical shape of the LV, and papillary muscle displacement. Impaired closing forces are generated by decreased LV contractility, LV dyssynchrony, papillary muscle dyssynchrony, and altered mitral valve annulus systolic contraction. Before moving on to our next segment, I'm going to talk to you about the Cliffs of Moher, which are Ireland's most visited natural attraction, with over 1.5 million tourists visiting each year. Located on the wild Atlantic Way just south of Dublin in County Clare, Ireland, they ascend to over 200 metres and stretch south from, for 8 kilometres to Hag's Head. The oldest layers of base rock that form these cliffs are over 300 million years old. Nature certainly took its time creating this one for us. In the center of these cliffs, you can see an enormous sea cave. This cave was actually used to film scenes in the movie Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. Many other movies have also been filmed on these cliffs over the years, including one of my personal favorites, The Princess Bride. We're now going to talk about the etiology of mitral valve regurgitation. The etiology of MR is varied and typically includes congenital abnormalities, such as endocardial cushion defects or clefts, myxomatous degeneration, which is synonymous with Barlow's disease, characterized by redundant leaflets, and, which are thick and hammock-like, fibroelastic deficiency, uh, which are basically thin leaflets and cordae, rheumatic disease, endocarditis, cardiomyopathy, which could be dilated or hypertrophic, and others causes such as SLE, rheumatoid, and ankylosing spondylitis. Degenerative MR is the most common, which is classically Barfos, bar, sorry, Barlow's, FED, or Morphins, and others are acquired or functional. This is a 3D view of the mitral valve. It isn't a standard view, but one can still appreciate the obvious cleft. Without getting too much into the nitty-gritty, you can further refine your diagnostic capabilities by appreciating the myxomatous disease exists as a spectrum. This was well described by Adams in his 2007 paper in Seminars in Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery. Without going over all the details, uh, it's not just an academic distinction. The clinical utility here is that due to fibroelastic deficiency, it's, it's actually harder to repair. This slide just dissects the difference between fibroelastic deficiency and Barlow's disease. 
It's worth teasing apart due to the fact that myxomatous degeneration is the most common cause of MR in Western countries. Uh, from a clinical perspective, it's important to be able to differentiate these two to help with surgical decision making. Fibroelastic deficiency is more a challenging repair due to the thinness of the tissue, although technically it's more simple because only a sing single, effect, uh, single segment is affected. This is a typical myxomatous valve. You can see that it's the redundant, thick, and amok like leaflets. This is another myxomatous mitral valve with A2 to A3 prolapse and a P2 flail. Here is an example of fibroelastic deficiency with very thin leaflets. Here you can appreciate the fibroelastic deficiency in a 3D view of the mitral valve. These pictures illustrate the gross difference um, between valve leaflet appearance in Barlow disease on the left and fibroelastic deficiency on the right. You can see the marked redundancy of tissue in a myxomatous valve versus the thin tissue in fibroelastic deficiency. This is a typical rheumatic valve. These valves are characterized by leaflet thickening retra and retraction, commissural fusion. Leaflet tips have a rolled edge appearance, giving it the hockey stick or golf club appearance to the anterior mitral leaflet, and chordal shortening. Of note, repair has a high failure rate, thus replacement is often preferred. This is a 3D image of a rheumatic valve. Note the moderate thickening of the anterior and posterior mitral valve leaflets and the decreased mobility of both. So just to review some of those differentiating factors for you as you're evaluating patients in your own practice in terms of rheumatic versus degenerative. So in terms of myxomatous, as you can see on the slide, mainly the posterior leaflet prolapse versus rheumatic, which is usually involves, or always involves anterior leaflet and has secondary prolapse from a restricted posterior leaflet. Myxomatous has an anteriorly directed jet versus rheumatic, which is a posteriorly directed jet. Myxomatous leaflets are thick, and while rheumatic leaflets have minimal thickening, and they have a hockey stick appearance. MR is often classified as primary or secondary. Primary is equal to organic or degenerative or myxomatous. It refers to the mitral valve being the problem, which is amenable to correction. Most chronic primary MR in the, world, in the developed world is degenerative. Mitral valve prolapse is the most common in the developed world. This is classically myxomatous, fibroelastic deficiency or Marfan's. Less commonly, infective endocarditis, CT disorders, i.e. connective tissue disorders, rheumatic heart disease, cleft mitral valve, radiation heart disease. What I'm saying is MR is the disease and the surgery corrects the problem. And you can divide this into degenerative, rheumatic, or endocarditis. Secondary MR is functional and may also be called ischemic, which is technically a subtype. The valve itself is normal. The problem is the abnormal ventricle, causing imbalance between the tethering forces and the closing forces. Restoring the valve is not curative. It can be ischemic or cardiomyopathic, and it's associated with a 20 to 30 uh, percent failure repair, failure of repair. Multiple words are used interchangeably to classify MR, and perhaps not so accurately and sometimes confusingly. So, Carpentier, as mentioned before, came up with a functional classification based on how the valve works. <laughs>
the type 1 is normal leaflet motion. It's usually from annular dilatation. The annulus becomes flat, which reduces the coaptation zone. It also includes clefts, aneurysms, perforations, and destruction from endocarditis. The actual MR jet tends to be central, and it's mostly posterior dilatation due to the weak and thin tissue. Type 2 is excessive leaflet motion, most commonly P2. This is from leaflet or cordal or papillary problems. The jet tends to be away from the diseased leaflet. The hallmark of degenerative disease is excessive motion. Some terms to know when describing type 2 lesions include billowing or scalloping, which is mild prolapse. The leaflet projects above the annulus and systole, but the coaptation remains below the plane of the annulus. Prolapse, which is the leaflet tip is above the annulus and systole, but still directed towards the left ventricle. Or flail, where the leaflet edge flows freely into the LA in systole, usually due to a ruptured chordae, and points to the LA. Type 3 is restricted leaflet motion, and there are two types here, there's 3A and 3B. 3A is structural, so the leaflet is affected in systole and diastole, and this is usually the case with rheumatic disease. 3B is functional, so the leaflet is affected in systole only. This is due to tethering in systole as a result of LV changes, dilatation, etc. It could happen with regional wall motion abnormalities, or annular or left ventricular dilatation. There is distortion of the LV and the mitral apparatus relationship. And this is particularly sensitive to loading conditions. So you'll see it in ischemia, LV dysfunction, or remodeling. So take a good look at this uh, echo clip and we will move on to answering the question about it, question number three. Question number three. The previous clip shows an example of bileaflet prolapse, anterior leaflet billowing, a flail anterior mitral leaflet, flail posterior mitral leaflet, or cannot be determined in this view. Here is an illustration of Carpentier's classification. So normal is the coaptation in leaflets all below the annular plane. Billowing is when part of the leaflet is above the annular plane. Prolapse is where the leaflet tip is above the annular plane but still points in the right direction. And flail is where the leaflet tip is above the annular plane but points into the LA. Note that all of these are determined from the long axis view where the highest point of the annulus or saddle rests and this determines where the actual annular plane is. This slide again illustrates what I've talked about in uh, real echo images. So prolapse versus billowing, B versus flail in image C. So the answer to question three is number five, cannot be determined in this view. It looks like billowing, but we don't know for sure if it projects above the annulus because we are not in a mid-esophageal long axis view where the highest part of the annulus is found. That was a four chamber view. Okay. Here's an example of a flail posterior leaflet. You can see the tip jutting into the And here's the 3D on fast uh, view, and some of you may appreciate the flail leaflet here. Just to show you an example of prolapse, this looks like a prolapse of P2. 
here's a restricted posterior leaflet. Uh, it appears that only one leaflet is moving, while the other is stuck in the diastolic or open position. So to summarize this segment, uh, this slide just uh, captures the different uh, classification of uh, the current Pentier system and highlights the different causes for each type of movement. Back to Ireland, Skellig Michael is the site of a monastic settlement dating back to the 6th century. However, one can find legendary accounts of Skellig Michael which date to pagan times back in 1400 BC. Skellig Michael is the most westerly sacred site in Europe, and it also finishes the line of ancient pilgrimage places in Europe. This line runs from Ireland through to France, Italy and Greece and on to Palestine. This line is known as the Apollo slash St. Michael axis, as it is believed to be known thousands of years before Christianity. Skellig Michael was the home to the monks of St. Fionon. These Skellig monks led very simple lives out here in the wild Atlantic, living in stone beehive-shaped huts. Although the huts were round-shaped on the outside, they were rectangular on the inside. You may recognize Skellig Michael from Star Wars movies. This was the last known hiding place of Luke Skywalker. Assessment of the mitral valve. Ideally, the decision to surgically treat the patient should be made before surgery at baseline hemodynamics and conditions. We all know that MR is subject to change under anesthesia due to preload, afterload, contractility, and compliance changes. Severity is known to decrease by at least one grade under anesthesia. Once we're in the OR and assessing the mitral valve intra-op, there are a few key questions we need to answer. What is the mechanism? What is the location of the MR? This is important as the valve may be deemed irreparable and replacement may be chosen. I think it's fair to say that in many centers, repair may be limited to isolated P2 disease and thus ruling out disease other than limited to a single scallop might be critical. Here in the hands of our surgeons, it's not the case, but there is likely some bias here towards more complex repairs. So keep that in mind. How severe is the MR? Although, as aforementioned, this shouldn't ideally be influencing decisions. Can the valve be repaired and will it be successful? And what measurement acquisition can we do? Such as the annulus and the leaflet size, etc. Are the leaflets thickened or calcified? Are they redundant? Are they intact? What's the leaflet motion like? normal, excessive, or restrictive? What about the coaptation point? Is it below, at, or above the annular plane? Is there a lack of coaptation? What's the color Doppler look like of the jet? What about spectral Doppler and 3D interpretation? The latest ACC AHA guidelines List indications for TEE as intra-op to establish the anatomy and guide repair, when TTE fails, or 3D for complex lesions. And this is by the European guidelines. Assessment in 2D. In summary, six views are used to assess the mitral valve. Mid-esophageal, which would be four chamber, the mitral commissural view, two-chamber view, and the long axis view, for a mechanism and location of leaflet pathology and direction and location of the MR jet with color Doppler. Then there's two transgastric views, which is basal short axis for leaflet pathology and location of the jet, 
and the two-chamber view, which is especially useful for the subvalvular apparatus, especially the chordae. The long axis view is used for most of the needed measurements, such as for annular dimensions. It's closest to the AP diameter, and this is the part of the annulus that dilates. Leaflet length, tenting area or height, prolapse height, the vena contractor width, the PISA radius, the continuous wave max MR jet velocity, and assessing for systolic anterior motion. Just a quick note about jets. The direction of the jet is important. Eccentric jets are almost always due to a structural abnormality. So if you see an eccentric jet, look for a structural problem. Wall-hugging jets are of concern. They have high energy. They are subject to the Coanda effect, which means that the blood is sucked against the wall and appears smaller by color Doppler. Central jets can be seen in isolated annular dilatation, bileaflet disease tethering, bileaflet myxomatous disease, bileaflet excessive mobility. Eccentric jets, like I said, directed away from the excessively mobile leaflet or towards the restricted one. And the transgastric two chamber, like I said, at around 90 degrees is especially useful for subvalvular components. The complex anatomy of the valve and patient variation makes it difficult to standardize the evaluation of the valve. This map is just a guide to get you thinking about the anatomy of the leaflets and how you cut through them as the omniplane angle changes. From my perspective, it also requires some reflection to orient yourself and think about the 3D spatial orientation. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time with it, but you can refer to the diagram, which comes from the ASE 2013 recommendations for a comprehensive exam. Manipulation of the probe includes not only the omniplane angle, but also inserting or withdrawing the probe, turning right or left to visualize all the parts of the leaflets. This requires a good 3D understanding of the valve. So for a systemic 2D exam, start with the ME4 chamber at zero degrees with the mitral valve in the center of the screen. The anterior leaflet is medial and the posterior leaflet is lateral. Inserting and withdrawing the probe will visualize A1, P1 superiorly or anteriorly at the level of the LVOT. You may need a bit of anti-flexion. And down to AP2, P2, and then A3, P3, inferiorly slash posteriorly. You may need to retroflex to get a good view. You can assess the scallops in diastole and the jet or localization of the prolapse in systole. From there, you move to the mitral, or the mid-esophageal mitral commissure view at 45 to 60 degrees. This is an apparent double orifice as you cut through the crescenteric opening. P1, which is lateral, and P3, which is medial, with variable amounts of A, but usually A2 in between. You turn the probe to, to the right to see the anterior leaflet and to the left to see the posterior leaflet. We then move on to the mid esophageal two chamber view at around 90 degrees and turn the probe left and right anteriorly to see the anterior leaflet, posteriorly to see the posterior leaflet. Expect to see P3 and A3, A2 and A1. Then the, uh, the mid-esophageal long axis view at 120 to 125 degrees, which shows you A2 and P2. Here you're cutting across the smallest diameter of the valve. It is the best view for assessing mitral valve prolapse. Withdraw and advance to see all the leaflets. Turning left shows A1, P1, and right shows A3 and P3. Transgastric basal short axis will show up any clefts and perforations. Take a look at question number four. Using T, the diameter of the mitral valve annulus should be measured. Now look at your options there. One, two, three, four, or five. 
Details about annular measurement are controversial in terms of one, the best view to measure it in, and two, what point in the cardiac cycle, i.e. valve open or closed. Classically, the annulus have been measured at zero and 90 degrees with the valve open. However, there is emerging recognition that using standardized omniplane angles and such that don't expect to capture the true AP diameter due to the orientation of the valve, refer to the microvalve map, is suboptimal. Old guidelines used a single four-chamber view to measure the annular diameter in mid-diastole, one frame after the maximal leaflet opening, and calculating the area using the formula for a circle, but this is known to be an oversimplification. Other resources propose using long-axis and commissural views with an elliptical formula. Maslow and Sidebottom, two of the Echo Kings, recommend using commissural and long-axis views, which are different degrees for everyone. This slide demonstrates that using 0 and 90 may not be cutting through the valve where you wish it to. A long axis view will cut through the true AP diameter, as demonstrated here. Even Maslow and Sidebottom can agree on the optimal time to measure. Maslow says end diastole, valve open. Sidebottom says end systole, valve closed. And at end systole, the valve again is under the most pressure. The best way to size the annulus may be with 3D multiplanar reconstruction. The goal is to achieve a slice across the annulus that gives the true AP dimension. Second best would probably be the long axis view. Most practically, uh, a surgeon would use a valve sizer. There's more to come on this topic. I'm not going to spend time on this, but just to remind you how we use three orthogonal planes to know exactly where the annulus is to get our dimensions for 3D and VR. Why is measuring the annulus so important? Annual plasty rings help improve coaptation. The surgical results are far worse if the ring size is suboptimal. The business of measuring the annulus and sizing the valves for rings or annual plasty bands is confusing and not standardized. It's very much surgeon and experience based. Most many surgeons use ring specific sizers. Some bands, like the simplicity band here, are adjustable and don't require sizing per se. Annuloplasty bands purportedly maintain the 3D integrity of the valve better than rings. They're applied to the posterior annulus only, making them more flexible. Band sizing is even more confusing and less standardized. Some types don't even need sizing. Conclusion, it's really based on the surgeon and his experience, and there's a lack of scientific justification. This slide just illustrates how valve sizers work. They give the option of using many different criteria, including intercommissural distance, intertrigone distance, anterior mitral leaflet area, or anterior mitral leaflet height. Notice that none of these are echo findings. So mitral valve sizing for annuloplasty is very surgeon dependent. <laughs>
if you talk to our own surgeons, they likely will say that they use our measurements as a ballpark in conjunction with the use of sizers. This slide uh, illustrates that out of all the studies used to measure um, mitral valve area, only one study used TEE. Therefore, the answer to question number four is number five. It does not matter how it is measured as long as the information is communicated to the surgeon. Just a word on annular calcification. The echo identification of mitral annular calcification is extremely important in patients coming for mitral valve surgery since it may not be evident pre-op. Paraprosthetic leaks are technically unavoidable during valve replacement in patients with severe mitral annular calcification, and it interferes with sutures and sewing rings. I'm not going to focus on 3D assessment, I just want to point out the way we display the images in standardized views. So it's on fast from the left atrium. You can see the aortic valve at 12 o'clock, the tricuspid valve to the right, the left atrial appendage to the left, the coronary sinus is visible, and the anterior leaflet is above the posterior leaflet, and the line of coaptation makes a smiley face. Just a reminder that QLab can create a 3D model of the mitral valve and give measurements, and as illustrated by this paper by Maslow. Before our final segment, uh, let me introduce you to Bush Mills, Northern Ireland. You may recognize this as the Dark Hedges, where you drive along the King's Road, which led Ned Stark to his death. Arya Stark away from King's Landing. This is probably one of the most photographed landmarks on the Game of Thrones map and a hidden road on the way to Bush Mills. Mitral regurgitation severity. This slide summarizes the ACC or AHA guidelines for 2020 on primary MR assessment. Several valve hemodynamic criteria are provided for assessment of MR severity, but not all criteria for each category will be present in each patient. Categorization of MR severity as mild, moderate, or severe depends on data quality and integration of these parameters in conjunction with other clinical evidence. I thought it was more important to think about the mitral valve and understand it than spend the time talking about numbers that you can look up on your own. But the presentation wouldn't be complete without at least superficially reviewing the criteria for diagnosing MR, and I have included the numbers for your reference. As, as per these new guidelines, grade A is at risk of MR, grade B is progressive MR, Grade C is severe asymptomatic MR, and grade D is severe symptomatic MR. The criteria used include jet area to LAA relationship, a ratio, vena contracta, regurgitant volume, regurgitant fraction, effective regurgitant orifice, and the agio. This table shows the 2020 guidelines for assessment of secondary MR or functional MR. The main differences are the criteria for ERO and RV are smaller. They don't include regurgitant fraction, vena contracta other than stage A, or angio for grading. And this is due to underestimation of the ERO with the crescenteric shape of the orifice and baseline compromised LV function and higher filling pressures. Otherwise, it's the same criteria as primary MR for your perusal.
These are the old ASC guidelines, which are broken down into qualitative measures and quantitative measures. They still use mild, moderate, and severe grading. This chart represents the qualitative measures, which is divided into structural and Doppler criteria. The structural ones include LA and LV size, what the leaflets and apparatus look like, and the Doppler ones include what the jet looks like on continuous wave in terms of shape and density, the mitral inflow pulse wave, the jet area to LAA ratio, and the pattern of pulmonary vein flow. I thought discussion around each of the criteria is warranted, so let's start with pulse wave mitral inflow. Pulse wave Doppler is used to measure the low flow velocities of blood through the left ventricular inflow tract, producing the E and A waves. E stands for early filling in diastole, and it is a negative wave as it is a wave from the probe. A is equal to atrial contraction, which will be in the same direction as E, both are away from the probe. The E wave is dominant or bigger with MR because there's more volume going into the LV from the regurgitant volume. When evaluating mitral regurgitation, one must assess the pulmonary venous flow by pulse wave Doppler. Normally, normal pulmonary venous flow into the LA is pulsatile and laminar, thus reddish. With pulse wave, you expect to see biphasic waves above the Doppler baseline, i.e. towards the transducer. Therefore, a forward flow during systole and diastole. This creates the upright or big waves of the respective S and D waves the normal tracing here to the left on the slide. There's also a small, usually upright A wave that occurs due to atrial contraction. Occasionally, this is a small reversed wave immediately after diastolic forward flow, corresponding to mitral valve closure. Blunting of the systolic flow, i.e. a small S wave, or systolic reversal, where the S wave is below the Doppler line, meaning the blood flows back into the pulmonary vein and away from the transducer appearing as a negative wave, can occur with MR, but their absence does not rule out severe MR, especially if chronic, with time for adaptation of the left atrium. Keep in mind that other things can be responsible for blunting and reversal of flow. Left atrial compliance, LV systolic and diastolic function, systolic blood pressure, and systemic vascular resistance. Reversal is mostly caused by MR. When you measure this, you want to put the pulse wave at least 1 to 2 centimeters into the pulmonary vein. Check both the left and the right. The MR jet direction may affect one pulmonary vein only. When evaluating the valve with continuous wave Doppler, we look at the density and the contour. A more dense jet means more severe MR, since density is a measure of how much blood is there. The shape of the MR jet also gives us information on severity. Mild MR has a parabolic shape, while severe MR has a triangular shape. When the regurgitant orifice is large, the pressure equalizes very quickly, so the flow happens right away, steep up and steep down creating the triangular shape. Color flow Doppler remains the best screening method to diagnose mitral regurgitation. It also allows a semi-quantitative assessment of the severity of regurgitation and can provide clues to the mechanism of MR. One pitfall is the appearance of MR by color Doppler is highly dependent on the gain and Nyquist limit of the transducer. Setting the gain too high or the Nyquist limit too low can make the MR appear more severe. When taken as a percentage of the left atrial area, the specificity of the jet surface area as an index of the severity of MR increases. Wall hugging jets should be considered hemodynamically significant until proven otherwise, and they always warrant careful examination. It takes a high energy jet to follow the LA wall for some distance. Owing to a physical phenomenon called the Coanda effect, which we mentioned before, these jets appear smaller on color flow Doppler than they actually are. They're almost always due to a structural 
leaflet problem. Question number five, the vena contracta should be measured in which view? One, ME4C, two, ME commissura view, three, ME two chamber view, four, ME LAX, or five, none of the above. Vena contracta width is the narrowest central flow region of the jet at the orifice of the regurgitant valve. It is measured in the mid-esophageal long axis view in late systole with the valve closed. In the diagram, the vena contracta is demarcated by the black line at the edges of the leaflets. If one revisits the 3D anatomy of the valve and the axes of the line of coaptation, one will appreciate that the long axis view is the view that will best give the narrowest width of the jet. The other views slice the line of coaptation obliquely and can make the jet look very wide when in fact it may not be, and thus it can be deceiving. So just some important points about the vena contracta. It's the narrowest portion of the regurgitant jet. It's high fl velocity laminar flow. It's slightly smaller than the anatomic regurgitant orifice. Cross-sectional area of the VC represents a measure of the effective regurgitant orifice area, a true parameter of lesion severity. It's independent of flow rate and driving pressure for a fixed orifice. And it's much less dependent on technical factors such as the pulse repetition frequency compared with the extent of the jet by color doppler. So it's reliable for central and eccentric jets but not multiple jets. Um, being a contractor with less than 0.3 millimeters is associated with mild MR and greater than 0.7 millimeters associated with severe MR and in between is a bit of a gray area. Some tips and tricks on getting an accurate vena contracta. So you want to keep your flow convergence, your VC and your jet area as linear as possible. Take a zoomed view so the size and the position of the box should be adjusted to focus on the region of leaflet coaptation, i.e. not the entire regurgitant jet within the LA. Use your color uh, flow sector to and narrow it to maximize your lateral and temporal resolution. Mid-esophageal long axis view only. Uh, set your scale to 40 to 60 centimeters per second. And, you know, there is an overestimation when the MR is not holosystolic. And the, the vena contractor width is affected by the geometry of the orifice. So 
whether it's circular or elliptical. Just a note about vena contracta in 3D, it's useful for the vena contracta area, more accurate for the ER away than the 2D vena contracta width. It's also useful for multiple jets of differing directions, and it's important to measure all these jets individually and then add them to get the total vena, vena contracta uh, area. It's measured offline by reorienting images and cropping the planes. It can be difficult and tedious to find the smallest flow area because and using this technology, small errors in measurement can lead to large percentage errors, errors, so you have to be careful. This is just a summary of what I've explained from uh, a very uh, good paper by Zogby uh, from 2017 about focusing here on the color flow Doppler and 3D vena contractor area. The same paper highlights two cases showing evaluation and quantification of the vena contractor area with 3D echo and multiplanar reconstruction. The upper panels show a case of primary MR with a circular VCA and hemispheric PISA, and another uh, with secondary MR on the lower panels with an elliptical VCA and non-hemispheric PISA. 3D echo has shown that the regurgitation ARF is often crescent-shaped in secondary MR. In such cases, the assumption of circular orifice geometry inherent to vena contractor width may result in underestimation of secondary MR. In a recent study, 3D VCA greater than 0.4 cm squared denoted severe MR. However, studies relating 3D VCA to outcomes have not been performed yet. So I think it's safe to assume after that that everyone knows that the C should be measured in the metasophageal long axis view. This is a technical vignette slide that just summarizes what we've talked about about jet area, which uh, depends on the orifice area, but also the orifice geometry, entrained flow, the rate of flow, the velocity, the driving pressure, pulse repetition frequency gain. Nyquist, there's a bunch of stuff there that, you know, that makes that jet area quite uh, not, not very reliable. For example, high left atrial pressures might reduce the size of the MR jet despite severe prolapse. This slide shows the jet area measured and highlights the need to use a proper Nyquist limit. On the right, the jet appears much larger with a lower Nyquist limit. The jet area is compared to the left atrial area, which is no longer an adequate measure on its own, i.e. the jet area just without the LAA. And it really depends on the recursion volume, the recursion orifice, and the velocity of flow. This slide highlights what can happen when you mess with the color gain. So if you turn down the color gain, uh, you may get an underestimation of the jet area. If you, if you turn up the gain, you can easily get an overestimation. This slide illustrates what happens when you turn and down and up your Nyquist limit. So you look on the left, they've turned the Nyquist limit all the way down to 17. And you can see this huge, uh, severe jet, which is clearly inaccurate. 
uh, and overestimated, uh, whereas a more normal jet uh, is apparent on the right at an IQOS, an appropriately set IQOS limit of 69. Uh, this is an interesting point. I mean, we don't always think of this, but transducer frequency do does make a difference as well. So if you look at the jet area with with a TE probe, which is about seven megahertz, it's always bigger than measuring with a TTE probe at two to four megahertz. However, this is balanced by the fact that altered loading conditions under anesthesia often cause a decrease in the regurgitant jet area. But I think it's still important to know. I apologize for repeating myself, but I, I guess it'll reinforce certain points to you. This, again, a summary slide about jet area physics and limitations. Uh, there is a poor correlation between jet area and MR severity due to technical and hemodynamic factors, which can be increased left atrial pressure, left atrial size, and underestimation of eccentric jets. Question number six, which of the following are required to calculate the estimated regurgitant orifice area using PISA? I'll let you take a look at those, because my mouth's getting dry. I don't want to repeat the whole question. So I'll just take a look at options one to five, and then we'll talk a bit more about it before we get to the answer. Effective regurgitant orifice area is calculated from the flow convergence method, or PISA, which stands for proximal isovelocity surface area. The principle, as blood approaches an orifice, blood cells accelerate along a series of concentric hemispheres seen by color Doppler. So the velocity increases as it approaches the valve. When it reaches the Nyquist limit, which is a velocity, aliasing occurs and the color turns from red to blue. At this point you know the velocity, you know the radius of the hemisphere so you can calculate the area, and then you can calculate volumetric flow at that radius. I want to try to make this simple for those of you not familiar with the concept. So what we know is the law of continuity says flow area times spatial velocity is constant within the flow stream that the velocity increases as the flow converges on the mitral orifice, the smallest hemisphere, and we can measure the velocity before and at the valve. We want to know the area of the orifice of the valve. Therefore, if we can find the area of the flow coming into the valve, we can find the effective or regurgitant orifice area. Here we see the three components you need to calculate it. Number one, the color Doppler in late systole in the mid-esophageal long axis view to show flow convergence. Number two, PISA measured from the tip of the mitral leaflet to the point of first aliasing. Note your Nyquist limit, seven millimeters at 72.8 centimeters per second. Gives us the velocity and area before the valve. Then you shoot a continuous wave Doppler through the mitral valve to find the peak regurgitant velocity of the MR jet which as you can see here in the top right is 6.12 meters per second, leaving the only unknown, the area of the valve orifice. For simplification, if the Nyquist limit is set to 40 centimeters per second, and the gradient across the MR jet is 100 millimeters of mercury, as produced by a five meter per second regurgitant jet, the EROA is R squared over two, where R is the distance of the aliasing contour. Just a reminder, the area of a hemisphere is what interests us here. So area of a circle is pi r squared, sphere is four pi r squared, and hemisphere is two pi r squared. The volumetric flow is the area times velocity, which is two pi r squared times the Nyquist limit, 
and the EROA is the volumetric flow divided by the MR velocity by continuous wave Doppler. And this is illustrated here on this slide. So 2 pi times 0.7 g squared times Nyquist's limit of 72.8 centimeters per second gives you a volumetric flow of 224 centimeters cubed per second. So the next step is to take that volumetric flow calculation and divide it by your measured peak MR velocity, which was 6.12 meters per second. You've changed it uh, to 612 centimeters per second to keep the units the same. So 224 divided by 612 gives you an EROA of 0.37 centimeters squared. So the answer to question number six is number four. We use piezo radius, Nyquist limit, maximum velocity through the regurgent jet to calculate our EROA using PISA. Now we're going to talk about quantification of regurgent volume, or RV. This is simply blood entering the left ventricle minus blood exiting the left ventricle into the aorta. But how do we calculate the volume? we calculate the stroke volume. You can imagine that the stroke volume is a cylinder, so we need to calculate the volume of a cylinder. This would be the area of a circle, which is the valve area, times the length or distance of the cylinder, which is VTI or with pulse wave. If you're like me, you might be missing the step to get from pulse wave to distance. Basic physics tells us that the delta distance over time is equal to velocity. So if we integrate our velocity times time tracing of the pulse wave Doppler, we get distance. In summary, VTI is giving you distance. The SV is VTI, or distance, times your area of a circle using the annulus measurements. So again, we're assuming the mitral valve and the aortic valve are circular. So the stroke volume across the mitral valve, which is VTI of mitral valve, using your pulse wave at the annulus, times the area of the mitral valve, elliptical, minus the stroke volume across the LVOT, which is the VTI of the LVOT times the area of the LVOT. The area of the LVOT of the aortic annulus is 2 pi r squared. This assumes the orifice is, circ is circular. This is hard and cumbersome, so nobody does it. You might also be able to take an EROA from PISA and multiply by the VTI of the MR jet. Regurgitation fraction is simply the regurgitation volume expressed as a percentage of the LV volume. So it's the percentage of LV blood flowing back into the LA during systole. Here's question number seven. The calculated EROA and RV based on the data from the next picture is 0.59 centimeters squared and 79.8 centimeters cubed. 0.15 centimeters squared and 79.8 centimeters cubed, 0.59 centimeters squared and 37.4 centimeters cubed, or 0.15 centimeters squared and 37.4 centimeters cubed, or finally more data is needed. So let's take a look at what we're seeing here. We're seeing a piece of radius in the middle of one centimeter. We've got a Nyquist of 44.7 centimeters per second and we're getting a regurgitant sorry a v max of 4.7 meters per second or 470 centimeters per second so here's what we need to calculate our eroa is going to be 2 pi r squared times your nyquist limit over your mr velocity and your regurgitant volume is going to be your eroa times your vti which was also 
present in that last side at 133.7 centimeters. So let's quickly run through the calculation. So EROA is twice 2 times pi, which is 3.142, times the radius 1 squared, multiplied by the Nyquist limit, 44.7, divided by the MR velocity, which is 470, which gives you 280.89 over 470, which gives you 0.59 centimeters squared. Then your regurgent volume is that EROA, which is 0.59, multiplied by your VTI, 133.7, which gives you 79.8 centimeters cubed. So the answer to question 7 is A, 0.59 centimeters squared and 79.8 centimeters cubed. The story of Kylemore Abbey is a truly remarkable one that spans over 150 years of tragedy, romance, innovation, education and spirituality. Built as a breathtaking castle in 1868, it is now the abbey and home of the Benedictine community of nuns. The Benedictine nuns arrived at Kylemore in 1920 after their abbey in Ypres, Belgium was destroyed in the early months of World War I. Settling at Kylemore, the Benedictine community opened a world-renowned boarding school for girls and began restoring the Abbey, Gothic Church and Victorian Walled Garden to their former glory. This is one of my favourite drives along the west coast of Ireland, Connemara. Finally, predictors of failed repairs. Predictors of failed repair must be divided into primary MR and secondary MR because the risk of repair failure is so much bigger, so much higher in secondary MR. For primary, the things you're looking out for is an annulus bigger than 50 millimeters. If there's more than three segments affected in terms of leaflets, disease of the anterior leaflet, severe calcification or not much tissue, or if there's a severe central jet. For secondary MR, large ventricle, a tenting area greater than two and a half centimeters squared, or a coaptation distance greater than or equal to one centimeter. Castillo et al. showed in this paper about re repair failure in, for a degenerative valve, if there was severe annular dilatation greater than five centimeters, or for functional MR, if the annular dilatation was greater than four centimeters. Difficult repair or MR recurrence or reoperation is associated with things like prolapse or flail of three or more segments, bileaflet pathology, atrialization of the posterior leaflet insertion, a large central jet, or extensive valve calcification. Reduced ability to repair can be seen with restricted leaflets or small leaflets, so a posterior leaflet less than 17 millimeters pre-op an anterior leaflet less than 25 millimeters pre-op, a small annulus diameter less than 35 millimeters, or short chordae less than 29 millimeters. In functional ischemic MR, uh, there is failure, failure to uh, failed repair in in areas with systolic tenting area of greater than or equal to 1.6 centimeters squared, severe functional ischemic MR or a diastolic annular diameter greater than or equal to 37 millimeters. Indications for surgery. I've included the ACC AHA guidelines summarized for you on the indications of surgery. I will let you review them on your own for the sake of time. Here is the algorithm for indications for surgery in primary mitral rigors from the 2020 ACC AHA guidelines. In summary, mitral valve surgery, class one recommendations recommended for symptoms due to stage D regardless of LV function, no symptoms but stage C2 plus LV impairment, so EF of less than or equal to 
and or an LVM systolic diameter of greater than or equal to 40 millimeters, or stage C and D with degenerative mitral valve disease and successful repair possible. Repair is preferred over replacement for severe MR limited to the posterior leaflet. Severe MR that involves the anterior leaflet, if successful repair is expected. Moving on to class 2A recommendations for repair. So it's reasonable if we're stage C with LV preservation. If expected success is greater than 95% and mortality is less than 1% at a center of excellence, or stage C with LV preservation and it's non rheumatic and there's expected success if there's new AFib or the resting pulmonary artery pressure is greater than 50. Class 2B recommendations uh, so consider MV surgery if. We're at stage D with an ejection fraction less than or equal to 30%. Consider uh, repair if it's rheumatic disease when other conditions in indicate surgery and expected success or if long-term anticoagulation is going to be problematic. Also consider transcatheter mitral valve repair if at stage D with New York Heart Association three class three or four symptoms if there's a reasonable life expectancy and they can't have surgery. And class three recommendations avoid MV replacement in isolated severe MR with less than one or two of the posterior leaflet unless repair is attempted and has failed. Here's the 2020 guidelines for surgery for secondary MR from the same paper. In summary, mitral valve surgery is reasonable, class 2A for stages C or D, plus a cabbage or an AVR. You consider mitral valve surgery for stage D with N NYHA class 3 or 4 symptoms, or consider MV repair for stage B and other cardiac surgery. Thank you very much for bearing with me for this needlessly overlong talk. I'm available for questions by email. Thank you.